everyone. Today I'm here with Kendara Blake, the author of the newly released Three Dark Crowns, and I'm asking her a few questions. So Three Dark Crowns is your first book in the new series. Can you tell us a little bit what it's about? Sure. So Three Dark Crowns is about triplet magical queens. So triplets, they're sisters. Unfortunately, on the island in which they're born, there's always been a queen. She always has a set of triplets. And unfortunately, you know, three girls, one crown. When they turn 16, they have a year, essentially, during which they need to off each other. And whichever one survives yeah. gets to be the queen. <laughs> That's just, I love the prose that. I was like, this is a brutal book. I'm excited oh, to read it. Because poor girls. I know. You gotta, you, just like, you have two sisters. Right from the yeah, <laughs> immediately from birth. You're gonna have to go one of your sisters. So, what was your inspiration for writing Three Dark Crowns? Have you always wanted to write a book like this? Or was it something you woke up in the middle of the night? Or? Well, I, I, I've always loved fantasy. Right. In particular, um, matriarchal fantasy. And I've always wanted to write in a matriarchal world. Right. So, so the inspiration for Three Dark Crowns was actually a ball of bees. Like I was at a book event in Oregon in 2013 and it was a cool one, like there was a hot dog truck and kids up oh, back awesome. performing music and it was a great event. But next to the hot dog truck, stuck into the tree, kind of like just it was like a boob made of bees. About the size of half a basketball. We're talking several thousand oh bees gosh, just swarming yeah. all over each other. And everyone was afraid, like, oh my God, the children are going to die. <laughs> we have to evacuate. But as luck would have it, there was a beekeeper who was attending the, the book fair. And she said, no, 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 don't worry. In the middle of that bee ball is the queen. They're just protecting her as she moves from hive to hive. We'll be fine. And we were, but I was obviously intrigued by this ball yeah. of bees. I'm like, why? Why is she in the middle of this ball? Does she have to do that every time she goes out traveling? Because yeah, it'd be really inconvenient. Yeah, like, be. children, thousands of you on me. I need to go to the I store. Need protection. Right? So, and after numerous, numerous hours of questioning this poor beekeeping woman, she told me that a queen bee will leave the hive for a number of reasons. But before she does, she'll usually lay about four or five queen eggs. And when her new queen daughters hatch out, they will murder the crap out of each other. And whichever queen bee survives gets to be the new queen bee. So I was driving home from the book event and I couldn't stop thinking about that and how wonderful it was. Yes. And how I really wanted to find a way to do it to people. And that's where Three Dark Crowns came from. So Three Dark Crowns is also in a matriarchal society because of beehive matriarchy. It just kind of lent itself naturally to matriarchy. And I don't know. Given some recent events, I'm really glad that I said it in a matriarchy. I'm really glad that I said it in a world where women rule and they always have. Right. And that is just the way of it. There is nothing strange on this island about women in power positions. Yes. And I don't think that there should be anything strange about women in power positions anywhere. Right, right. Awesome. So it's, I like how you got it strictly from bees. That's from that, bees. That was, that's really cool. No one would think that. I would never think that. That's I, awesome. Well, and usually when I when somebody asks me this question about one of my books, uh -huh. I just like, have to make up some BS because I really don't remember <laughs> to the day yeah. that, where yeah. the idea came from. But this but one you this do. One, it's like stuck in your I've mind. I've got a real story forever. For yes, that's awesome. So let's talk about the three sisters. I love that you gave them all such unique magical powers, how they're all different. What inspired you to give them, like, take these magical powers? You know, you have the elemental, you have the poisoner, which I love. But you don't read that a lot. And you have this, like, power for people just to endure poison. That, that They do that for fun. Like, they love it. it. They take yeah, great pride like, in their ability to ingest powers? poison. Yeah, I mean, I would have never uh, thought it. it the poisoners were probably the most fun to develop and yes. the most fun to work with. For one thing, I really enjoy writing about food. Yes, and I love reading about it. <laughs> they're, um, if you're, have you ever seen the show Hannibal? No. On the show Hannibal, which is of course about Hannibal Lecter from right. Silence of the Lambs, there's a lot of food preparation in a cannibalistic kind of right. setting. And, but the food preparation is beautiful and lovely, but at the same time monstrous because you know what's going into this food. Yeah. But at the same time, every episode of Hannibal, like even thinking about it right now, my mouth's kind of watering. I'm like, mmm, <laughs> everything Hannibal cooks looks delicious. Yeah. <laughs> Full of people, I don't care. So uh, it, it was a lot of fun to work with the poisoners in that way and to create these poisoned feasts and yet, and have them be so 
hopefully appetizing sounding. It did, you know, it did, but you know, like you it's know, like it will kill it you. It will kill you like. dead. And they just love it. They turn their noses up at non poison food. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. Awesome. And as for the naturalists, which the naturalists are the ones that can make crops grow, and they have they can commune with animals, yeah, really make animals do them. things. And also they have one particular animal who's like they're familiar. Yes. So it's like a demon in um, the Golden Compass. Right. You're kind of emotionally bonded. They know what you're feeling. You know what they're feeling. It's a lifelong bond. Like familiars are granted right. much longer life than they would awesome. if they were just like a regular animal. So I worked with that because I like animals. Yes, I do too. And I love writing about spunky animals with personality. Yes, that's awesome. So that's why. That's awesome. When I went into this book, I was for sure I was gonna like one sister and I was gonna be like, kill your other two. But you made all the three sisters so likable. I was like, I can't fathom picking like one to like be like to offer other sisters. Like, did you know that going into that you were gonna make them all like, you know, be you all want to root for them, or did you want one to be like the stronghold, the one that was gonna like you wanted everyone to root for? See, I knew that they would have their arcs. Each sister was going to have their own story. Um, they're gonna have to come into their own in their own way. Right. I knew that each society, each city, because they're each raised in a different city. Exactly. Yeah. A city full of naturalists, a city full of poisoners, rich, rich, powerful poisoners, yes. and a series, uh, a city full of elementals who are also ruled by kind of they've allied with the ruling religious class yes. of the temple, ruled by priestesses. And when I started writing it, because everybody asks, well, who's your favorite? Queen? Yeah, you have one. And I thought. It was going to be Queen Arsinoe, the naturalist, the middle triplet. Right. Because in my brain, she was the hardest underdog. Yeah, and she I always was. go hardest underdog because that's who I end up rooting for. Plus, she had the animals. Yes. But like the, the naturalist queens never win, almost never. Yeah. They're just not disposed to that. They don't. It, it just doesn't. It doesn't work out for them. There was one great naturalist queen, and she had a wolf as a familiar. So of course, the wolf tore her sister's throats out. Yeah. That's why she won. Brutal. But Arsenal doesn't have a familiar yet. Yeah, that's true. And her naturalist family, who kind of adopted her, they love her, but they also know like she's probably going to die when she turns 16. So just yeah. give her as good a life as she can. And good luck. Bye. Bye. See you later. <laughs> We're sad, but we knew it was going to happen. Um, but when I got into the writing of it. I thought it was going to be almost like an arsenal book, but actually, I really care about all of them for right. different reasons. You know, Mirabella, yes. the elemental queen, even though she's really strong, she has such a good heart. She she's does. the only one who remembers her sisters from when they were children and who loves them yeah, and who really doesn't does want to kill exactly. them. Yeah. And it's I so heartbreaking that. for her to discover that they don't remember yes. at all. I know. So, and then with Queen Katarine, she. Uh, is a poisoner and nobody wants another poisoner queen except for the poisoners. Yes, but she's so meek and sweet And she just wants to make them proud of her and she's been so abused yes. So it was really easy to sympathize with her as well yes. So now I don't know I guess I've gotten myself into a pickle Yeah, <laughs> mm, it's what like are you gonna do? two queens gotta go. What am I gonna right. do? See, I like is it is it Catherine or Katarine? I say Katarine, but anybody Katarine. can they can say. I her. like Katarine's story arc. I think just the poison and the feast with like the scorpions. It was just so interesting to read about. Like I just wanted more of that. Like they just sit at a feast and just eat poisonous things all night long. Just, yeah, and they just revel in it. Candied scorpions. Yes, mm, you just know, belladonna berries like in a really nice sugar, you know, sugar oh my mix. Gosh, so uh, it sounds good even now. And I'm yes, like, totally and, but if we ate it, we would. We Within just, the yeah. hour. <laughs> so, were any characters in this book inspired by somebody you know, or you know anything inspired by something you know in this, this book? Is, this is another question that I could actually answer yes okay, to. Okay, awesome. Normally, no. Like I, I am notorious for putting people's animals in books. Interesting. Tibble, the cat from Anna Dressed in Blood, was my cat. I still have yet to read that because I don't do scary stuff. Though. It's also funny. Okay, good. It's scary funny. I can, I can handle it. As long as I've heard, as long as you read it in the daytime. It's okay, good. I'm gonna do it. Uh, and in the Anti Goddess series, the German Shepherd Lux was my brother's childhood dog. Awesome. It was an attempt to entice my brother to read. It did not work. Oh, that's <laughs> sad. But uh, normally, if I'm going to put pieces, I just put pieces of the people that right. I know. So not like, somebody like yeah, exactly. Like Thomas's car from Anna Dressed in Blood was my best friend's car from high school. That's awesome. I'll do stuff like that. But this time, the character of Luke, who is one of the naturalists, he has been Queen Arsenault's yes. most fervent supporter from yes. the beginning. 
He's a very sweet guy and he has a rooster for a familiar. Yeah. This sassy rooster named Hank. Well, I have a friend who like saves birds and raises chickens and turkeys. He actually has a turkey that had to sleep on its chest when it was a baby because it would cry if you put it in an incubator. And so, so he's like, well, I just got to sleep with this turkey on my chest for a while, no I idea. guess. <laughs> and he named the turkey Fresh, which I found inappropriate. Fresh, <laughs> yeah, fresh turkey. Fresh, fresh turkey. Oh, fresh turkey. <laughs> Come here. But he'll never, I mean, he'll never eat it. Yeah, exactly. It's just a pen. Uh, so when I realized that this guy was going to be in this book, and he's gonna have a, a rooster familiar. Well, that's my friend Luke. Yeah. So Luke is actually something. That's awesome. Has he read the book? He has now. And I, I we managed to keep it a secret until it came out. And then he was reading it. And he's like, is it me? Is this me? But he didn't want to ask. He's like, it can't be me. He doesn't want to be back. It's, it can't, it's not really book. me. So he, he asked my other friend, he's like, is this supposed to be me? And she's like, duh, your favorite rooster's name is Hank. Your name is Luke. He looks like you. He acts like you. Was he, like, he was he honored? Did he, was he happy with the way you wrote? Him? I actually, I I haven't. He said he said this was his favorite book that I had read. Oh, good. So I hope that means. But he didn't actually say like, oh, I love the character of Luke. Maybe he was trying to be like modest. Yeah, that's true. He didn't want to be like, my favorite <laughs> character was myself. myself. I'm awesome. <laughs> that was my. I'm gonna be the lead in the next book, right? <laughs> That's awesome. So it's safe to say this book left off on a pretty awesome cliffhanger. Like I get the last page and I was like, "Ooh, we gotta wait a whole nother year for the next book." Which not so, is there anything you can say about the next book without spoiling anything? Like, like three words that you could say, or just what can we expect? Well, I and mean, it's called One Dark Throne, right? Yes, okay. it's called One Dark Throne, and it's like the ascension year has begun. Yes, so it is on. Like, it is on. Yes, it is time. Fight to the death. So you can definitely expect. Assassination attempts. Okay. You can expect people trying to avoid those attempts. Yes. Uh, you can expect a lot more scheming as the people in power continue to try to um, make their will be done. And um, yeah, I mean, there, it's it's been a twisty, turny book to write. Like through the whole thing, it took a bunch of twists and turns that I didn't see coming, and the sequel did the same thing. So I hope it's very exciting. Um, I hope everybody likes it, and it will. Like the story that starts in this one will wrap up in the second one. Although I think we might do a little bit more. In the world. So is this a do? Is this a series or duology or it's trilogy? It's a series, but okay. it's a duo. How long did it take you to write Three Dark Crowns? Like from idea from that beehive to when it got, or like I guess when you put it in your publisher's hands? Or I'm not a writer, so I have no clue how the process works. Well, I mean, I guess we all kind of have a different process. I like to have an idea in my, like, rolling around upstairs for about two years. Right. Before I want to put things to paper. Because okay. I, I'll have this thought, and then I'll, like, shove it away. And if it's a good idea, it'll keep, like, Hey, me. come on. <laughs> and if it was a dumb idea, then they just get forgotten. So this idea kept coming back, it kept coming back. I actually wrote another book that was not published in between it. Oh really? Because that book also had like been bugging me. But I told my uh, my uh, agent about them both. And she listened politely while I told her about the first one. And then when I talked about this she one, like, this. her like, eyeballs were like, ah, like, this is that the is one. the one. And I'm like, okay, it may be the one, but you understand I have to write the other one first. Like, these things have an order to them. Yes, that's true. Uh, so I wrote that one. I enjoy it. It probably will never see the light of day. Aww. And then, but it felt good to write it and have it out of the way. And then I wrote this one. I think I wrote the first hundred pages about three times. Wow. Because I just, this is a shift. I'm normally set contemporary and set in our world. Right. Uh, I can use our slang. I can use our pop culture references. Yeah, and this one's this a whole is different world. A whole different world. It's um, well, at least it's in the past. Yeah, that's okay. so. I mean, they they speak English, and it's um, so it's in the past. So I couldn't have any pop culture references. I had to find new and interesting ways to sneak in sarcasm into my characters yes. besides relying on pop culture. And it took me. I wrote the entire draft, turned it in. Let it sit. My editor started to come back with edits, and I'm like, oh my god, no, it's all wrong still. So I had, I'm like, I'm gonna rewrite this in a month, like from top to tail. So I rewrote it again, completely, uh, because I still had the tone wrong. Like the voice wasn't quite right. The way that they were speaking still felt slightly too modern right. to me in places. So I had to, I had to just go and rewrite the entire thing again. Oh I think I ended up rewriting it a total of maybe three times. Wow, that's crazy. 
you got it right though. So. I I hope so. Well, I, I mean, think it would have been much nicer for me to been just <laughs> on the, on first, the go first time. Oh, yeah. Horrible block. Have you always known that you wanted to be a writer, or what like sparked that within you? Um, well, I've always been a reader. I was one of those kids that dragged my mom to the library every week in the summer to check yes. out the same eight unicorn books. Oh, and then the I made her read them to me. Oh. Horrible. I think she still hates unicorns. <laughs> Never. Yeah, I made my mother hate it. unicorns. That's so sad. No. <laughs> but from there, uh, I, I could I could read before I started school just because she read to me so much. And I never stopped reading. I still love picture books. So do I. And from that, it just a love of stories and kind of just a boredom with reality. Reality. Yeah. You want to say this? Yeah. I wanted to go into other stories, and that led me to tell now. Awesome. But I did go to college for something else because I wanted to be practical. Right. You wouldn't have a fallback. Yeah. I, I wanted to not live with my parents forever and starve. Yes. But it turns out that that backfired. Because um, as I was working in corporate America, I called my parents and like, can I just come and live with you? I'd rather starve than be here anymore. And then uh, I went to grad school to do creative writing. I devoted myself full time to writing, and that's when everything started coming together. Awesome. So it's been like it's been within me. It's been within me, and I mean, awesome. I did have like ten years of hard rejection, just yeah. not being quite good enough, and I had to, you know, work on my game and up it. But fingers crossed, it's going well. Yeah, you're doing great. It's going I think okay. so. You know, you know that you're a writer, but do you have any other hobbies like besides writing? I don't know. Is it consider writing a hobby or like a profession? It's, it's, I mean, a profession. It's, yeah, it's a, it's a profession now. Um, God, that used to bother me too when my mom would be like, "Oh, it's a nice hobby to have." Like, no, it's not fun to me. Is eating a hobby? I love to eat. Yeah, no, I consider that a hobby. I think that's a great hobby. I like to hike. I I have two dogs and a cat, and I like to you know hang out with them. I take them to the dog park a lot. Um, I mess around with my cat a lot. We'll go hiking. Uh, my my husband and I will play some very bad tennis, which I love I the sport too. of tennis because no matter how bad you are, it's still fun. That's true, and you can do workouts. Yeah, you can you can just be terrible. <laughs> just you don't care. Yeah, just keep just smacking the ball. <laughs> exactly, and going and getting. It. <laughs> That's awesome. So, what is your um, favorite book of all time? Do you have one other than your eight unicorn books? Oh, yes, those are so great. I would love to like get my eight unicorn book collection back. I should check those out. You should gift them to your mom. <laughs> She'd be like, I'm gonna disown you forever. She would throw yes, those unicorn books at me. Uh, I can't choose like a favorite. I love so many books. Uh, I, Jane Eyre. I love Jane Eyre. I love Stephen King's It. It's like a masterclass in writing horror. Right. It's still just I just want to read it and barf because he was so good at such an age. Um, Joe Hill's NOS 4A2 about like this guy who kills kids' parents and abducts them to a place called Christmas Land. Oh my god! This is my favorite horror Christmas story. Uh, Caitlin Kiernan's The Red Tree, about um, a haunted writer, essentially, like a writer haunted by her own demons. And uh, maybe, it's a very unreliable narrator, I love unreliable I do narrators. too, they're very interesting to read about. Marcus Sedgwick's Midwinter Blood, um, The Genevieve to Hulkies, Wink Pong Midnight. Yeah, she, I read one of her short stories, she is, she's a beautiful way of writing. Yeah, yeah it's like haunting. In it's a way. haunting, yes. and it's, it's, it's playful. Yes. It's really strongly stylized. But it's so accessible at the same time. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. awesome. I absolutely love her writing. Um, I, I read a lot of Anne Rice when I was a kid. Ooh, and awesome! I love Brady Stanellis. Like, I love American Psycho. Awesome. She like the really poor stuff. I yes. And I'm the complete opposite. <laughs> <laughs> what about this year? Have you read any books this year that have been like? What's your favorite book of the year? So of far? the year? Well, well I, I only have like two more books. I just like went off like on a tear. Because I, I was on I was on tour, so I actually had a lot of time to read. Uh, so I read *Clarial* by Garth Nix, which was my first step into the abortion in the series. Um, so, and I feel like I, I made a mistake because now I'm like Team Clarion, which is you know, floor of the mass. Like, who I understand is like a huge villain. Oh, I don't so know. when I go back through, I'm just gonna be like, no, I want floor of the mass to win. Yeah, you <laughs> but clearly you, you probably shouldn't want that. Uh, that was excellent. Um, what authors inspire you? Probably the ones you mentioned, like oh, Stephen King, yeah, Stephen Joe, King Hill. Joe Hill, Kate and Kiernan, um, yeah, Milan Kundera. Okay, he wrote you know, The Unbearable Lightness of Being. Oh, okay. Um, 
and he really turned me on to philosophical novels and all of the different things that a novel could be. Um, it was really difficult read for me. I think I had to read the first chapter of Under the Lightness of Being maybe five times before yeah. I was like, I get it now. Yes. But after that, I mean, I just I just loved it. I devoured everything he wrote. I always keep a spare, unread Milan Tondero book because I know he's super old, so he'll be dead soon. And I need something to read while I mourn him. That's Oh, that's a so, good idea. That's a yeah. really good idea. But it's, it's hard to leave it there. Like, yeah, I, want to I, want to, I want to read it right now. But okay. I know I'm going to need it. I'm going to need it. Yes, that's very, very true. Well, I think that's all the questions I have for you. So thank you so much for coming on to my channel and answering my thank questions. Thank you so much for having me. I will leave all of her links down below and be sure to check out Three Dark Crowns and order it and buy a copy because <laughs> it is so good. Like, oh, so good. I love to buy. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.